Hello and welcome to the weekly MG EVs podcast streaming tonight on Monday the 2nd of August 2021. We're here to talk about MG electric vehicles, uh, the MG ZS, the MG5 and the MG HS and we're hoping to inform and entertain you for about an hour or so. I'm Stuart Whitman, username Stuart46 on the forum and joining us this week are MG EV owners Dave Stewart from Inverness in Scotland. Hi, Dave S on the forum. And we've got Les Burrows from Wigan. Hi, Les Burrows on the forum. And we've got Michael Fisher from South Wales. I use the name Fish to Bean on the forums. Okay, and then we've got Dave Bell from North York, Warwickshire. I nearly said Yorkshire there. Um, <laughs> FCAP 53 on the forum. And then we've got... Um, from North Yorkshire, Innovations Development Manager at the Chorley Group, uh, Miles Roberts. Uh, hi, uh, Miles per kilowatt hour on the forum. So good evening all. If you're watching live, thank you very much for joining us. And please click the like button and join in on the discussion in the chat window. We do value it and try and pick it up so that we can discuss sort of current and live um, comments. And they are really useful. If you're watching later, thank you for choosing to watch this video. And uh, please subscribe to get a notification of when we go live next time. In tonight's podcast, we are chatting about Miles's experience driving the MG5 long range. Um, also uh, on the forum, on the MG5 forum, we've had a bit about uh, a whining noise. And uh, yeah, no misses jokes, uh, please. Um, there's a bit about the MG roof rails as well. And also, um, we're talking about motorway speeds, uh, one of the polls we had on the YouTube, um, one of the YouTube polls, and anything else that takes our fancy. Um, so, shall we get the ball rolling? Um, Miles, should we start with the first topic, which is the new MG5 uh, long range? Over to you, please. Yeah, certainly. So, um, I got the hand, my hands on the uh, new demonstrator that arrived at Chorley last week. Um, so it's been PDI'd and have mats put in it and, you know, cleaned, uh, et cetera. And, um, and because I'm a bit of a tart, I've also had the option wheels fitted. So it's got the uh, diamond cut black wheels on, uh, on there as well. Um, and uh, took a little bit of a drive with it today, doing a bit of filming. Um, I didn't pick the car up with 100% charge. So when the cars come off the transporter, they're not at 100%. And I picked it up from our compound, so um, they don't have charges at the compound. So it was uh, it was actually at 85% charge. Uh, and it was displaying around, I think it was 192 miles of range at that point. And I, um, so first impressions, it looks identical, basically. So there's, there's very, very little difference between the vehicles. Um, both the original and, and the new long range version. The difference is you see externally, you've got the camera mounted up behind the uh, rear view mirror on the top of the windscreen, uh, which visually looks down the road ahead, uh, looks for the white lines, et cetera, for use with the MG pilot system. Um, and you've got a radar mounted in the lower front grille of the uh, front bumper. So that then reaches out and checks the distance of the vehicles in front and it's used for the forward collision detection and things like that. So externally, that's pretty much the only differences you'll see. Um, everything else about the vehicle looks identical. Um, there are, however, been some uh, other improvements. So the roof rails are now rated for 75 kilos instead of 35. Um, now, at first glance, these look identical. Um, there doesn't appear to be any difference. They, they are still, they do still have the uh, the mid of the three sections rather than being one continuous bar. So um, to the untrained eye, they look identical. Um, I don't know what, and I'm still haven't found out what engineering has happened differently to enable the different um, rating to be used for these bars. Uh, whether they're using a thicker gauge of aluminium or whether it's some different mountings, I just don't know. Um, I've not been able to find that out from the engineers as yet. Um, with regards to other improvements they've made, so the uh, boot space now, inside the boot um, previously was quite a thin carpet, um, lower level cover on the, at the bottom of the load floor. Um, 
and this has now been improved. Uh, there's now a, a much thicker, it's probably about two centimeters thick sort of MDF um, sort of composite, you know, board, uh, which has got a hinge in it about uh, a quarter of the way along. So you can lift it up whilst the back of it remains sort of flat and tucked. So if you've got some I don't know, cables underneath, whatever, you can lift up the front whilst there's still something in the boot. Um, but also it's now on two levels. So you've got the option of raising the boot up slightly to give you a flatter load level uh, going through to the uh, rear of the, uh, through onto the uh, back of the seats. So you can either choose to obviously drop it right down and give you the same boot capacity as you had before, or you can raise it up so that you have a, a flatter load level or less of a lip to get over to get into the um, uh, into the car itself and you're putting things in the boot. Um, there's also now on the left hand side, previously on the right hand side of the boot, as you look at it, you had a, um, a netted area where you can put your charging cable and things. That remains, but on the left hand side, where there was previously a sort of void, that now also had the net across it as well. Um, which makes it a little bit awkward for fitting the um, existing MG5 load liner because effectively that corner that normally goes in and tucks into that side is now fouling on the on the net. You've either got to lift the net up and, and shove it underneath or you've got to push the net down. If you're using the higher boot position, you can push the net down the rails and then it sits on top. Um, so that's not ideal with the current accessory, but I don't know if there's a new load liner perhaps coming for this new model. Uh, we don't have one in stock at the moment anyway. Um, and so, um, yeah, so moving to the interior, so it's got the MG Pilot system fitted. So MG Pilot, uh, we used to on the MG ZS EV um, and on the MG HS plug-in hybrid. So MG5 previously just had um, old-fashioned cruise control, so it just had a fixed speed and that would be all it did on, so you set it to 60, it keeps you at 60 miles an hour. Uh, with MG Pilot, what it does is if you set the speed to 60, it will keep you to 60 miles an hour, but if the car in front slows down, it will slow down to keep you at set distance from the car in front. So you can use, you've got three settings, so you can twist this stalk and that um, gives you access to, uh, well, at 60 miles an hour, it's, I think it's 150 meters, 100 meters and 50 meters is the braking distance effectively that it gives you between the cars. Um, but it, it adjusts with your speed. So if you're doing 30 miles an hour, those distances come down. Um, and if you, obviously if you're going faster then those distances increase as well to give you a sort of safe braking zone. Um, so it does, I say speed adjusting cruise control. Now on the MG ZS EV, uh, when it's accelerating and braking, it's accelerating obviously using the motor, but when it brakes, it uses the friction brakes on the car. Um, even if it's only braking very lightly, it will still put the friction brakes on and, and the power gauge drops to the zero and doesn't go into the regen section. On the new MG5 um, long range, I can confirm that I've tried it and it, it does use regen braking very effectively. Um, I saw, I mean, I, I still had at this stage like 90, you know 80% battery capacity left, but I was seeing sort of, you know, 100 amps uh, coming up on the, uh, on the battery. Uh, volts, amps, revs sort of section of the uh, menu. So I can see that it is, it is regenerating, it is giving good amount of regen back into the battery. Um, in terms of the extra range, um, I mean, I was driving, I, I've put, I fitted a roof box to the car. It's a uh, Thule, Ocean, Thule Ocean 80. So it's like a 250 litre roof box. Um, so it's a smaller uh, sort of roof box, only because it's the one that we happen to have in one of our showrooms already, and I didn't have to go spend 500 quid on it. Um, so I fitted a roof box and some roof rails, um, and I was using that for driving around, doing the filming today, and driving home. And I still got, I think, 3.8 miles per kilowatt hour. So um, with my, with the range that I'd driven, I drove, I think it was, it's like 75 miles on just over 30% of the battery. So it was, it was calculating out as if I'd do like 220 miles real world um, on that charge, which with a roof box on, I think it's pretty, in motorway driving, I think it's pretty good going. Um, I haven't tried it without the roof box, but uh, one thing I would say is anyone that's thinking of getting roof bars for the MG5, go for the Yakima Wisp bars. Um, 
There's a couple of other, but Sandy, I think, on the forum was saying before that he went for Yakima Wisp bars, and I had them on another card before. These roof bars, they're, um, they're quite long. They're about 85 mil thick. So, you, you know, if you get a cheap roof box with just U-bolts on, they often don't fit because they're often 80 mil U-bolts. If you use T-track accessories, so the things that click into the top and sort of slide along, um, which a lot of modern bike carriers and roof boxes do now, um, it's brilliant. So these roof, bar, uh, roof bars are, are sort of aerofoil shaped. And um, when I was running them without the roof box on at all, um, I took it up to speeds in excess of the national speed limit on a section of private road, obviously. Um, and there was no noise whatsoever from the roof. So I previously had some of those cheap 30 pound little ones, you know, the Brio roof bars that, you know, you get like universal ones. And I couldn't take them above sort of 30, 40 miles an hour without a droning noise from the uh, reverberation of the air going across the tracks. But on these wisp bars, it's absolutely silent. And even with this roof box on, really, until you get to sort of 70 miles an hour, you don't even notice it's there. So I'd really recommend those. Um, I've got to be honest, I haven't tried the official MG accessory roof bars, but looking at the shape of them, I feel that they would be a lot noisier than the wisp bars. Um, so I know I'm not going to make any friends at MG saying that but i think i also think that the um, that the wisp bars are, are the best roof bars you can get um, what was the brand more sorry the brand yakima wisp bar so it's uh y-a-k-i-m-a -A. um roofbox.co.uk sell them they don't to me so um if they if they want to consider it after watching this podcast feel free um but um you yeah, know they're they're a really good set they do uh three different options they do the um the standard roof bars which are the ones that go all the way across and stick out slightly past your rails through bar through bar and they uh, that gives you a longer wider load area so if you've got lots of bikes you want to carry often that's the one to go for because it gives you like you know 1.2 meters of of length to go in um the ones i've gone for are the ones that you can just see up on the video on the roofbox website there which are the um the flush bars so they've got the ends covered over and it gives you about sort of 90 centimeters in the middle that you can fit accessories um, and they're slightly more aerodynamic, slightly smoother looking perhaps. And then they also do some uh, really low profile ones that fit really low, rail down, bar, yeah. really low down on the um, rail. So they, you've got the, uh, the rails going side to side like that. They basically go directly horizontally between them without going up. And, um, but I was concerned about that because I've, I've read that if you have less than 10 centimeters between the roof box and the car roof, it can cause quite a lot of noise and seeing how low the rails are on our cars if we were to put the roof but those low profile uh, bars on i suspect that they probably would have been too too low and it may have caused more noise um might be okay with like uh, if you're just using bike carriers and things but i think that with a roof box that you probably need the higher ones um uh, yeah. can i ask how have they got the extra range is it just by adding more cells or is there clever wizardry in there or something i believe it's different chemistry i haven't actually found out which chemistry they've gone with now um, i'm waiting for a reply back on that um so the overall weight of the car is only increased by 15 kilos mm -hmm. so despite the fact that they've added an extra nine kilowatt hours of battery um and also they've added the gubbins for the uh, mg pilot in terms of you know the radar sensor and camera and things they've only actually increased the weight of the vehicle by 15 kilos um, so I imagine it's a different chemistry, which is more energy dense and that effectively they're getting the same size pack, but with more power in it. Um, so physically it'll be the same, you know, it could be the same overall dimensions of, of the battery pack. It doesn't protrude any further down underneath the car or anything. Um, but it just uh, has more energy capability within it. Did you notice any more like with, with driving it, any difference at all? Uh, not so far, no. So uh, apart from, uh, as obviously that you've got a bit more range, um, and then it just you know it displays when you've got fifty percent left, it's still showing it can do. Sort of but the actual momentum. drive, you know, like with the the accelerator. No, there's no additional power. So the motor is exactly the same. So the motor feels the same as you're driving it. There doesn't feel to be any difference in weight transfer or anything like that. Um, it feels very, very, very similar, very, very familiar. And I've done sort of three and a half thousand in the last. MGs, uh, MG5 that I've had, um, and uh, I've not seen any difference really. Well, apart than apart than side by side, they look pretty much identical. 
And are those 16-inch um, wheels as well? Sorry? It's 16-inch wheels? Yeah, 16-inch wheels are standard. As I say, I've put the option wheels on, on this new demonstrator. Um, just because I'm going to the um, EV festival at Gaydon this weekend. And um, so I wanted to sort of accessory it up a bit to try and make it stand out because I figured if I've got MG UK at this side with their big exhibition stand and six cars, and I've got MG EV owners group this side with 20 cars like last year, I mean with just one in the middle, I suspect it might not stand out. So uh, I'll be at the stand at the uh, show with a full roof box on with tinted windows with the option wheels um, with some uh, stickers on the door saying it's the MG5 long range, etc. Just try and make it sort of stand out a little bit. You ain't that... pimping it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm rolling it in glitter. Yeah. <laughs> Where's that? Is that Gade and that's in the Midlands, isn't it? Uh, yes. No, uh, Warwick, between Warwick and Coventry, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Dave will tell me if I'm geographically oh, yeah. wrong. It's on the M40. Yeah. Just off the M40, north of there. Is that Saturday and Sunday or just Saturday? Just Saturday. Or? So if you're free, it'd be, it's a really good day. It's the British yeah, Motor yeah, Museum. It's the British Motor Museum. It's a really good range. Day. I've got a short range five, and I don't know if I'd get there and back in the same. We could get there, and there's about, I think, is it some like 75 charges there, Dave? There's a, there's a lot. Yeah, it's, there's a Jaguar Land Rover's employees car park. So yeah. it, there's, oh, okay. there's like every, every space has got a charger. Yeah, yeah, got you. Oh, okay, but I only have in the short range. I might not be able to make it. So. Now I might I might actually do that Saturday. Did you say? Yeah, Saturday. I think it starts about nine, goes on till about four. But it's it, it's a real it's a, it's a good day because you get to see all the electric cars out anyway. Yeah. But then also you've got the British Motor Museum with all the classic cars yeah. that are there, and you've also got the Jaguar collection, which is got all the James Bond cars and all sorts in there. And yeah, it's, it's, to be fair, you can spend the day at the museum. Yeah. And enjoy that and you've still got the ev festival on top as well for yeah well that's a good shout might do that cool about 10 pound each i think it's you know it's not a bad day out really no cool. sure, you'll come back bristling with knowledge about evs this will be interesting to see yeah i'm quite interested about this, this having charges there actually <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah i don't know so much about them right okay so anything else with the five the new five just to say, really, it's it's a good car. It, it drives the same as the previous one. The interior is all exactly the same um, as before, with the exception well, of the boot that's got that addition. Um, under the bonnet? You know what? I haven't even lifted the bonnet yet. I assume it looks identical. I assume no it's got front. a big plastic cover over it like before. Was there not going to be a front in it? Uh, no, not on this one, oh, I don't okay. think. I think the, the European one may well get a front, but I don't believe right. this one gets a front. Les, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to ask a good question. Um, around about April the 10th, I think it was, I put a, a picture to on the retrail forum, the retrail, the, the old retrail that was going at the time. And uh, I took two pictures. And on the original retrails on the MG5, there was two screws at each joint. It was in three pieces. Yeah. Uh, and there was two screws at each joint, the bowling under the bottom. Um, I double checked this on a ZS, and them screws weren't visible at all. There was no screws at all on the ZS. Um, it, was, it, looked like it, was in, it was in three pieces, but how they fastened it together, I don't know. Um, but anyway, thanks for the photographs you po posted today, Miles. I've seen the photographs on the uh, forum today. And looking at your photographs on the forum, um, yeah, you've got the, you've got the roof, the cross rails on with the roof box on, but I can see in the reflection on the roof, the actual top of the roof itself, the rails are here, and the roof is there. I don't see any screws. I don't see anything where the original ones were, and I'm wondering if that's what they've done. They've done it the same as the ZS. They've altered some way. You know, I honestly, to be honest, Les, I actually meant to look specifically at it to get you the answer. Yeah. And, I, and I forgot. I took the photos and I completely forgot yeah, to look at that. To get, it's difficult to see because it's on the underside. Yeah, no, I know. What I, I have I, to do is I have a towel on the roof of my car, put the on top of the towel, but to take a picture of it. Um, it was difficult to photograph. I must admit it was. But um, there was two number six wood screws that I got. I got two cell tappers at it. Um, yeah. On each joint, 
which was not known on the ZS. I actually went down for a local deal and had a look at the ZS. And the ZS is in three pieces, but there is not a sign of any fixing in any way, shape, or form. And I think what they've done, I think they've done the rails on the new five now, the long range, the same as the ZS to get it back up to 75 feet or whatever it is. Well, I mean, I can go have a look now. If you if you want me to put a hold, I put it on hold for five minutes. I can run down and have a look, or I can submit a photo later on. It's up to you. I can. If everyone if everyone else has got anything to talk about, I can run down and do that. Yeah, we can do that. Come on, we'll do that. Right, okay, right. I'm going to do it live, Mark. Yeah, we'll do it live. Still do that. So I'm, I'm asking, is them screws still there? Or are they not? Yeah, I'll go have a look. I'll go have a look. Give me a chance. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, live as we speak, then. So Miles is doing that. Okay, so. Um, I know obviously we've got ZS owners on here as well. So let's do a bit of ZS owners chat. <laughs> this um, is behind that screen. <laughs> this is magic, isn't it? Yes. He's just going down. <laughs> He's MG5. He's on the <laughs> These MG5 newbies are taking over. Yeah, I, and uh, we're feeling a bit like an invasive species. So we need to kind of, you know, before we become, become, before we become parasitic. Um, <laughs> So I think you might have mentioned it on one of the podcasts that I was absent on. Any of you three, would you consider a long range five now? At would the you? moment, no. no. Um, I'm, I'm doing enough miles for we'll cover um, on the ZS. So it's, it's just not worth it, um, basically selling up the ZS for a long range model. Yeah, same as with you, ever two? You have two Daves? Um, yeah, the only reason I wouldn't is it's easier to get in and out of the oh, yeah. ZS. Yeah, I remember speaking about that just, before, just, yeah. It's just easier to get in and out. Um, yeah. Actually, uh, I it's very attractive to me anyway. It looks good. And I did mm. hear that the actual seat position is quite high in it, so it may not be that much of an issue. No, there's not a lot of difference. I, um, <clears> not a lot of difference from Dave, nothing. nothing. <laughs> Absolutely no difference from whatsoever. But the, only, I guess the, the only main thing difference is on the and roof. frame, on the, on, on the door frame, basically, the main difference. There's not a lot of difference in the seat type, so. Intrepid no. reporter's back, no, so back to the five. No, I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> there are two screws at each end, but they're cut. So they're hidden hidden on, on each joint. On each well, they're, still they're still there. Um, yeah. They're hidden on the photos because uh, I had the clamp of the thing sort of exactly where they are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you for that, Mark. Well, yeah, done, no, they are still, they are I, was still I was just wondering if they go the same way as the ZS, that's all. I was just wondering how they've done it. Yeah, but I, haven't exactly. seen the, I haven't seen the new one yet. Miles, how did you manage to go outside without going out that white door behind you? <laughs> go through the wall. This is through my, <laughs> my green screen. You see the magic of TV. Brilliant, isn't it? We were just, while, while you were gone, we were talking about transitioning from maybe a ZS to a 5. And, and I guess as well, use ZS owners, you're looking at the 21 model anyway, aren't you? Because isn't that going to be out soon? I saw something on one of the forums earlier. Is that going to be increased range as well on that? Um, <laughs> oh. There's rumours that there will be, but... Uh, yep. Yeah. They're, gonna, they're not going to make it smaller, are they? Yeah, no. So word on the street. The word on the street that's like... <laughs> You see, I'll say something, and then I'll get a phone call tomorrow morning from MG's marketing department saying, Miles, can you stop doing this? Um, <laughs> so basically, uh, there is a facelifted version of the ZS Petrol, which has been in circulation for over a year now, or about a year. Um, and the MG EV ZS is getting a similar facelift um, at some point within the next couple of months. Hmm. And it's going to get some other improvements, which will be of interest to EV owners, um, such as improved range, um, such as perhaps... Tow bar? I don't know about tow bar, but potentially there may be some sort of way of communicating with one of these to be able to operate certain features. There you go. That's also, all I'm, uh, that's all I'm willing to say at the moment. Also, Peter Ross, is the improvements to uh, MG Pilot on the 5, will that uh, possibly uh, go to their facelifted MG ZS? 
Yes, I would be very surprised if they did this to the MG5 and then didn't do it to the ZSEV. What I would say is that probably, well, I'd say definitely it's on the new, it, it will be on the facelifted ZSEV. I'm not sure as to whether they can roll it out to the previous model ZSEV. I don't know if the hardware is up to the challenge or not. I don't know. Um, I will try and find out. There might be that they do a Comfort 2 style update that, you know, they do a software update and it makes it suddenly work with Regen. I don't know. Miles, will I have it in my Marvel R when you've got ordered from me? Yeah. Uh, the, right, so I had a, I had a convers Can I say this? No, probably so not. Go on. I, had a, I had a conversation with um, the MD of, of MG UK um, last week and I asked him specifically about the Marvel R. And he feels at the moment that it would be too expensive to bring to the UK because the in Norway they have you know no VAT that they pay on electric cars which makes it a lot lot cheaper and it's still about 33 grand over there well if you had 20 percent onto that it's gonna be sort of 40 grand and that's a lot of money and there's a lot of the truth is there's a lot of competition between the models yeah. um you know you've got the Hyundai Ionic 5 you've got the Kia EV6 you've got the ID4 you've got the Enyaq you've got the Teslas you've got a lot going on in that sort of price bracket and if MG decide they want to make it as a right on drive model, they've got to commit to, you know, a decent quantity of, of, of that particular model. It's, it's not like with, um, you know, with, with Norway, they're on left hand drive, same as China. So they get, you know, they can minimally, it doesn't cost them much to, to change things. However, I have rather seen on Facebook today, a rather interesting dash cam video. Somebody caught a uh, Marvel R towing a box trailer through Buxton in the Peak District today. Um, so I assume that that is, it was left on drive. I assume that that is the MG engineers checking the towing feature of the Marvel R, making sure it works well with hills. Um, but it was, uh, it was definitely a Marvel R. It had a bit of duct tape over the badge on the front, but it was, it was fairly obvious that what it was. So um, the Marvel that's, R. Been... That's Indian market as well, isn't it? Indian market is left hand drive. Left hand drive, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, they need to get some decent numbers. So I think they're going to see how it goes in Europe before they bring it to the UK, or maybe wait for some sort of price reduction on the cost of components to help bring the price down so that it's more palatable for UK market. So I think that at the moment, MG would struggle volume-wise to, to justify a £40,000 EV. Um, there's nothing else in the price bracket that they sell currently. You know, the most expensive cars we have at the moment is ZSEV, which is... 10 grand shy of that. So it's it's a big price hike. Having said that, there are a couple of other new models that will be coming in the next year or so. There will be an electric MG3 sized car and we're expecting a two seater sports car as well. So, uh, well, the emotion. Well, emotion or, or the, the new, you know, actual production version of something similar. But yeah, so there are some. You know, some more cars coming, but I think they've got to make sure that they um, obviously get to the, the price right for the market and that they don't, you know. Um, but, yesterday, yesterday I seen yesterday, highly camouflaged, but I knew what it was. It was called a Pavia. Um, and I think MG needs to come with something of that size, like the MG3, for example. Yeah, so that's good. Yeah, that's, 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 that's something that they could make a lot of money out of because there's a lot yeah, of. So, Les, that's that's one of the things that's due to come next year. Um, it's probably yeah, about twelve months off, but yeah, the the MG three. I went to a design studio um, back in March twenty twenty, just before lockdown, um, and we looked at design sketches of the new of concepts for the new MG three. You know, looking at different interior and exterior design features that we liked. You know, different design directions and you know where we thought that the yeah. should go. Uh, and obviously, they've been doing a lot of work on that over the last couple of years. So, yeah, because at the moment, there isn't really anything in that sort of market. You've got the because the VW E up, which is quite small, yeah, and the Skoda City Go E or whatever, and the you know, yeah. they are me, you know, the, the, all those sort of site, you know, the, the things that they like each other. Yeah. Then you've got the Zoe, which is quite a bit bigger but still in the small car class. And then you've got the Leaf, which is loads bigger, and then you get onto all the bigger stuff, and it's all SUVs after that. So I do think there is a market, definitely, for a... If you look MG at the other one, is the Corsa E. 
and, and the Virgil to double or eight, which uh, but both of which about thirty way over price, way over price. But you can see you can get a ZSEV for less money than what you can buy a Corsa E4, and it's a much more bigger car. Much I don't know. We sell the Corsa E in our Vauxhall show. Um, but the, you know, and there is there is a hardcore of people who like the course and will, you know, they've had Ooh, lots of courses. Yeah, they've, courses, had, yeah. they've had loads of courses and they, they like it because they know it and they feel you know even it's just the iteration of the next one and the next one it's familiar and they like it and they know the sizing, um, yeah. and so there is a you know there is a, a market certainly for that but there's a whole load of people who, I mean I learned to drive in a Corsa, um, one of the early ones and um, yeah so I, I sort of. When I think back to a Corsa, that's what I sort of think of like a driving school car, you know, really small, you know, sort of first car. And I don't attribute it to a sort of £30,000 price point. Um, so I think that that's the, the sort of issue there with um, the price that they are. Uh, yeah, I think the MG3, I think if, an, if an MG3 electric can come out around the sort of, um, you know, it'd have to be obviously sub 20 grand. Yeah. To, you know, when you think about where the MG5 and the ZS sit. So in summary, I'll just say about the MG5 is um, it's a good car. The long range yeah. makes it a bit better. Um, and um, I think it's nice to have those improvements of the I think that the MG Pilot is is it works well. I mean, I, you know, I used it on the motorway all the way back. Um, it worked quite well in the traffic jam I had when I got to the end of the motorway. Um, and I'll be driving the car down to um, Gaydon, as I say, on Saturday. So if anyone's coming to the EV show, they'd be uh, very welcome to come have a look around the car. Does it, does it, with the Pilot, do you have a speed limiter that you... I don't suppose you need one, do you? Because you're on You that. have the option of a speed limiter. So one of the things that... Yeah, so you've got on the second stalk, which you currently use for uh, cruise control. So you've got, if you bring it towards, you've got cruise control active. If you push it away, it cancels it, yeah? So on the long range, when you push it away, it cancels the cruise control, but then it gives you the option of a speed limiter. So okay. then you just press it and you can either have a manual speed limiter, where yeah. you can manually set the speed as you want, or so you've got the intelligent speed limiter where it reads the road signs and it can set the speed limit according to the road signs it sees. Yeah. That's something I'd really, really, you know, when I was listening to the, the, the pod last time, I wasn't here when you're talking about it. That's the one thing I think that I do miss from my other car was having a speed limiter with the motorway miles that I do. Um, and yesterday we were driven, or I was driven home by my wife from uh, and she doesn't drive the car as much as I do. And we were bombing down the motorway and I just happened to look up even after a bottle of red wine, I looked at the Speedo and it had a nine on it. And it wasn't the second figure. And because the engine doesn't sound like it's doing that nine figure, mm. it's scary. And I just think, you know, I became the limiter, but we we kind of just, it would, be, it would be useful. I know I do really miss that because, you know, potentially a lot of points are a ban, isn't it? And... You guys we, have a lot of private roads down there, do you? We have our own oh. private road, yeah. You no, know, he was drinking so much that it it was sixty nine yeah, and it was exactly. ninety. <laughs> I was well. I tell you what, if we were doing sixty nine, those cars in the other two lanes were doing forty and thirty respectively. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it, it wasn't the alcohol. I can guarantee you that. But it, the, the speed limit, and, I, and I, I'm, I must admit. And I'm I'm in Les's camp because I think you were disappointed as well, weren't you? Because you kind of shell out the money for a, a new car in in December, yeah, yeah and then you get kind of gazumped by a better model. Um, Six and, months later, uh, yeah, and it, that's the way the world is, though, isn't it? So I'm not bitter about it. Had it had a pan roof, I oh. would have been bitter about it. Yeah, that, that was, was very upsetting right about the first year. I thought, oh, I don't worry. Really. I can see underneath what I was I'm, I'm just sucking on the shin now, and I'm just carrying with what I've got for the time being. I won't be, I definitely won't be upgrading just for the sake of the uh, profile, etc. I won't be that. No. I, won't, I don't need it. I won't need it. Anyway, if I had it, probably it wouldn't anyway. 
But yeah. no, there's no way. I'll wait now till the next one comes along. The one that was promised was going to come along in October this year, but didn't. Uh, it doesn't look like it's coming now anyway. So the face, so the, fa the, the facelift, facelift. So obviously the one what we've got is a mid yeah. uh, mid cycle enhancement. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the mid cycle. Whatever you want to call it. So MCE. We've got the mid cycle enhancement, which is the. Uh, the bigger battery in the MG Pilot. The facelift version um, is probably about, uh, well, I'd say nine to 12 months off. So one of the things that China, Chinese companies seem to like to do is um, perpetual innovation and really rolling out new products very, very quickly, one after the other, one after the other. Yeah. And um, that's not just cars, that's everything. It's not just cars, no, no, but we, you know, you buy a phone these days, Saturday, two weeks later, a television set, Saturday, two weeks later. Yeah, so that's the thing is that whatever you know, it is you buy these days, it's changed in no time. Yeah, so obviously, the problem with a car is that it's a, a, a big, a big investment, you know, it's not a, a, yeah, yeah, it's really a 400 quid TV, it's a you know, yeah. 25 grand or more sort of investment. So, um, but yeah, so the facelift version, which Europe is getting late this year. It should be coming to us in about twelve months. Um, and it, but at that point, I think we're just going to be gaining the well. I say just we're going to be gaining the new facelift. If they keep the same spec as Europe, then it should get eleven kilowatt charging on AC. Yeah. Um, which doesn't make a big difference in the UK because most places aren't compatible with three phase. Most domestic chargers and home chargers and work chargers are on seven kilowatts single phase. Um, but or the uh, vehicle to load system, which has been used by Hyundai Ionic 5, um, Kia EV6, um, the, uh, uh, so the new MG5 will do vehicle to load, so it'll do like a, uh, it'll run basically up to I think it's two and a half, three kilowatts of power out. So it's going to be uh, able to, you know, power quite a few sort of like if you go into, I don't know, if you go to a picnic somewhere or whatever, you, you know, if you go to camping, you'd be able to run your lights for your camping off the, off the car. So um, that'll come, I say, looking at uh, probably twelve months time. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll see what comes next. Uh, I mean, one thing, uh, Intio drives on the same sides as us. Yeah, I thought they did. I was well, India's right hand drive, but India's also price conscious. Left hand drive, like us. You know, so, not your right hand drive. We're both sides of the road. <laughs> and, yeah, India's right hand drive, but yeah, it's um, it, it still is. You know, although it's a, a large market, they are price conscious, uh, like we are, and it's you know, I, I think that you know, get to the point where if it's going to be sort of forty thousand um, pounds. Again, there's a lot of cars that you can get for that source of money. They've launched the the Hector in uh, MG in, in uh, India, and I think that's their sort of like you know halo SUV over there. Um, I forget the price of that. It is still drastically less than forty thousand um, pounds. Quick Google, one second. Um, also, is the height clearance on the long range the same as the standard range? Uh, the roof, the clearance, the clearance on the road by the looks of it. Uh, I believe it's actually nine millimeters greater. I think that this, the, the, uh, I read some, I've read on the spec that the, the ride height is nine millimeters taller, but I can't think of any good reason why. Nothing seems to protrude down or step any differently underneath. So whether they've raised the suspension ever so slightly, I can't imagine. It drives the same. I can't imagine they put different springs on it. Um, but the, there is apparently nine, nine millimeters, I think it is extra ground clearance. Maybe so, it wants to be an, a ZS, maybe they all do, really. Not all, we all, we all say we like MG5, yeah. but actually, we want a ZS series, it it just um, wants to be a ZS, or um, yeah, okay. So, okay, so we've done the long range chat, yeah. Have you got it for a long time? Is it what your, your demonstrator, Miles? Uh, it's uh, well, I've, I've, I've taken it. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, I've got it until, well, middle of next week, probably. Yeah. I've, I, I mean, until somebody asks me for it back, really, is how it's going to okay. go. Um, I've said I'm taking it to this show on Saturday, expect it back next week. What I may do is basically keep it until somebody says, Miles, you need to bring this back now. Yeah. <laughs> um, or, or if maybe Saturday, when I come up and have a look, we might be able to do a deal. Yeah, just do a swap, yeah. Can I'll you take the stickers off, though, before I drive it back? 
Well, they're not going to be that event. I'm just going to go faster stripes on it, mate. You'll have some big black Viper stripes going up the front. That's yeah, it. fantastic. Flames would be great as well. <laughs> um, right, brilliant. Okay, so another thing I want to talk about is the the YouTube poll uh, with this the about driving on the motorway speeds, Mike. Is that your? Was that your? Yeah, yeah. so it's my little suggestion. Yeah. Um, basically, there was um, five um, options on there, uh, being. 55 mile MPH, 60 MPH, 65 MPH, 70 MPH, and 75 MPH or more. And then, of course, equivalent miles, um, kilometers uh, yeah. per hour. Um, was 90 there at all, no? Something stuck somewhere yeah. 75 or more. All right, okay, that'll do. Uh, a 4% of uh, people um, uh, uh, tick that option. Yeah. Uh, whilst uh, 37, 70, 45% at 65, which is my long distance speed. So when I'm traveling from Newport to London or um, other places, Birmingham, I'll do 65, whilst work is a bit faster. And then 14%, 60, and then only 1% would do 55 miles per hour that's when you tailgate in the truck isn't it in, in the slipstream yeah oh, that's 60 <laughs> yeah. yeah so so going around the, the the screen then dave stewart so when when you're on a motorway do you consciously drive at a certain speed yourself i found myself having to think oh my god i'm driving quite fast here and and reining it back a bit so I almost scold myself if I'm doing 65, 70, because the range differential is is quite noticeable. Yeah. Uh, of course, I've got to travel over 100 miles to get to motorway, guys, but let's, oh, of course. let's yeah. not bring that one up just now. You choose to live there. Uh-huh. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, the dual carriageways and things like that, yeah, it's, you know, that trip I had down to the uh, southwest of, of Scotland was all an A-class road and it was busy. And I think my average speed was only about 40, 42 miles an hour. That's the day I thought I could maybe have made 200 miles on the one charge. Never on the dual carriage where the motorway, you just see it going quicker and quicker. So, uh, so now I've kind of changed my driving style. I would say I'm more of the sitting about 60 and letting the, 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 the miles of this world go zooming past me. Never since I've been driving on the, the motorways, you know, in the years that I have, have I ever been overtaken by so many cars since I got this EV? I must have met. Um, and it's it's almost it's almost you know where you do change driving style. I do lots and lots of motorway miles. I'm, I'm just approaching thirteen thousand since um, January. So, and on the motorway, which is where I sit most of the time driving, I have found that I'm in lane one and two a lot more. But having to do more overtaking to just get past those lorries and those slower drivers. The ones in the ZS is doing 45 because they've got shorter range or something. But um, but in all seriousness, no, yeah, my driving style's changed. And I generally won't go over 70 because it chews up too much range. But 70, to be honest, at the moment, we're enjoying the weather, aren't we? And we're enjoying the temperatures and we can yeah, get a lot further on 70. That. And I've found that I've gone back to driving how I used to pre-EV. And it's certainly, I, I, I don't know if the others are the same, where if you're on a longer journey, if I'm on a longer journey, you're more conscious, aren't you? But if you're on a short, like today, I did well within the range. It was a 60-mile a round trip. So I just, just drove like I used to, I guess. And what about you, Dave Bell? How about you, driving-wise? Again, very similar. I, I've come from having a Nissan Leaf. So I obviously a very careful driver. <laughs> um, you... If I'm going to do daily driving, I'm fairly relaxed about it. If I want to get somewhere quickly, I get there. You know, yeah. I just drive as I need to. But if I'm going on a long trip, say, you know, Scotland, then I will probably set to 65 on the, you know, on the on the cruise yeah. control, and either sit behind a, a lorry, or else, or if a coach goes by, I'll just pull out and sit behind a coach, um, and I just increase to 70. You know, and that that's fine. And I find I do get probably about half um, a, a mile per kilowatt hour better doing that. 
even no. at even at 65 70. I think as well someone just just commented um mr b suggested that driving at low speeds you know is defeating the object to a point um but you know it's a direct but what's a low from, speed i mean well, exactly if you're doing 45 then obviously yeah, that's that's crazy stupid yeah. <laughs> if you're doing if you're doing 55 <laughs> yeah 55 56 the same as an hgv which they're limited to then yeah i'm you're suggesting just... that's not dangerous but no. certainly 45 would be and it and it would yeah. be um you know i i personally think driving a 45 50 is too slow for a motorway yeah um, because you are going to get people backing up yeah and you stick with the lorries it's the yeah, minimum. yeah definitely and there's nothing wrong with that is there if that's no. how you want to drive especially if you're eking out the miles uh most definitely no, it's well, quite relaxing that. as well just to set it and let it yeah, go definitely just there's... put an empty pilot that's it bother me i just set the road to one and got whatever road i'm on i mean i've just done a long trip um, up through the centre of Wales last week and I got fantastic mileage, I can't believe it. Um, and I was well impressed with the car coming back through there last week. Motorway work, it's, it's got to be said, well it has been said, the TVs don't like motorways. They're not happy with motorways because it's dropping all the time, it's constant power all the time and it's just dropping back. So I tend just to set it around about 65. In, I have noticed there's, there's a big difference, well not a slight difference between 62 and 65. Yeah. Just like half a kilowatt hour. Just that 62 to 65, third of all. And all them people who's passing me shoot, well, I just look at the panel up and I'll back in the go. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I'm fair. Burning panel up, left, right, and centre, charging down at 70, 75 miles an hour. Just yeah. keeps it going. So, I think, uh, I think when we get more of the new. Tomorrow, and if I can do it in four hours, I'll be quite happy. Yeah. I think when we get more of the new um, electric highway uh, charges up and running and, and reliable and you know all that kind of stuff, I think people would be more inclined to just go, yeah, let's drive, because they they won't have the charge anxiety they've had so far. I, I don't think it's range anxiety anymore. I think it's charge anxiety. No, charge anxiety, no. Yeah. yeah. I, I had something similar. I drove um, to Nottingham and back um, weekend Saturday, and it was chucking it down all day. The rain, it was, I was M1, it was crap weather. And, yeah, terrible. Um, I set the cruise, well, I was driving along where possible, because at one point you get really torrential, but where possible, I sort of stuck to about sort of 60, 65. Um, but it was torrential rain. It was really, really hammering it down. At one point, um, this big Ford Bronco thing, um, coming, not Ford Bronco, what they call the pickup trucks, came the other way. Yeah. Um, on the motorway and it must have driven through a massive flood on their side of the motorway and that he was doing 50 miles an hour that way we were doing 50 miles an hour this way and his water came all the way over onto our side of the carriageway like they, i was in the middle lane and it still got me it absolutely thundered on the glass that it was going to come in because it was like proper bucket loads of water hitting the car at about 100 miles an hour um and it was uh that was really awful um but we still managed to get back uh in total it was 100 and i mean we did some like we did 210 miles, I think it was in total. We had eight percent left. Wow, that's um, good. Which for crap weather and yeah. I actually had roof bars on there. I didn't have the roof box on. I had roof bars on. Um, so I got like 3.9 miles per kilowatt hour. I think it was from that average, which I thought for that torrential rain and, and everything else, I thought it was pretty mm. good going really. Yeah. Um, I mean, the same. And I was going back through mid rain last week. I got all when I still had about 16 percent left on on the uh, clock, and mm. I worked it out, I could have probably hit 240 miles on that I couldn't have done something. Interesting, I think the thing is as well with the MG5, because it gives you a percentage readout, you're a lot more confident with taking the mileage low down. So I saw, I'd like, you know, when I got back home, I had like six, seven percent left. <clears> and I actually, I didn't put it on charge straight away because it wasn't my cheap period. So I went to, um, so I used, I used to then go down to the supermarket and back and see another couple of miles on it. And I could see, so when I finally plugged it, it was at 3% remaining. <sighs> Um, whereas with the MGZ SEV that my wife has, um, so on, what day was that? Sunday? I drove, I'd not charged it because I'd charged mine the night before. I'd not charged her after a couple of days at work. So her car had like 45 miles on it when I got to it. And I drove like a 20 mile round trip and it's sort of getting it down to sort of like 20 miles remaining. And it's flashing at me and I'm going, yeah, I'm not actually sure I can trust it because, I, you know, at that point, we had 12% left, but it was the fact that it's sort of flashing low battery low battery low battery you know restricted power mode don't use don't do um aggressive driving is not recommended i think is the term it uses 
Um, well, you ever seen once on, on the Bible that it said, um, what did it say now? Uh, low power or something. I can't remember exactly what it said. Something yeah. about lack of power or low power. down to about 12%. I don't yeah, so know I, if said it that long. I had, a, I had a warning saying, you know, low power charge battery, that it was uh, low yeah. power, uh, aggressive driving is not recommended. Yeah. And when I got down to 3%, it said air conditioning um, performance is reduced due to low uh, state of charge. Now, I've never been brave enough to take it below 3%, so I don't know if you what other messages you get there. No, I've never got that. Um, I've never been below that. Well. The red light flashing, have you? The red light flashing and then the mileage just goes to three lines. Yeah, that's um, 3% on the MG5. Yeah, it's about 10, about 10 miles it does that. Yeah. The, um, I've, I've found as well, the the message for mine, I don't know if everybody, Les, I don't know if yours is, but it says low battery, please charging, or something that's like right, that. Yeah. Please charging, right. yes. Please charging. But after that, it, it says performance reduce or something. It says performance, low performance or something. I can't right. remember that what it said. Uh, so yeah, I only did the one, but just tried it the one to see what would happen. I yeah, just went down that far. I mean, the twenty-five percent, the the clock turns from green to uh, red at about twenty-five percent. Yeah. Go down a little bit further. It goes a little bit deeper red. I don't know if you noticed that. Not mine, but anyway, seems to. Um, maybe it's my eye. I don't know. Well, I've never pushed it below twelve percent. Never, never. Just that once I went down and said, "I'll it." So, I, I tend to drive it even on a journey. Now I'm going tomorrow down to London. I will get down <coughs> about 130, 140, maybe up to 150, and then I'll stop and charge. I don't wait till it gets right down to 40 hours because you've always got the top problem that someone might not be working or might not be one word or might be queuing up for ages. So I just I, I just plan my journey out and set the time with it, and then just charge as I need to. Well, I, uh, I had a bad experience last week. I was coming back from Aberdeen and I got to, and uh, Miles will be holding his head any minute now. I got to Inverurie and uh, used one of the Charge Play Scotland E Bolt, big old chunky ones. And it, I keep having this problem. It doesn't recognize the car and it doesn't recognize that the last charge has been completed. So it keeps coming up saying, I've got 99% battery and I know I haven't. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, well, I'm not going to muck, muck around with this. I've got enough to get to Huntley. But between Huntley and Inverurie, there's quite a lot of uh, hills going up the way as well as down the way. And I got to the Instavolt at Huntley with, uh, I think I had four or five miles left and sweat coming down there. Horrible. But just Instavolt, just, and I, honestly, you could it's almost see the car. You could almost see the car lapping up the electricity going, oh, I love this. <laughs> Uh, you I tend to, I, I look, that's all I do on that match now. I just stick into the vault and see what the vault was. Well, I know it, it might be a few pence here. The only other one, it, like tomorrow, I'm going down to London to say, I, I will probably stop it. It will be the, the grid server because I know that's going to be reliable. I know it's brand new. Um, you know that one day, don't you? It's, it's just, it's brand new and it's um, it's great. I've been there a couple of times now and I, every time I've stopped it, I've been no problem at all. Well, yeah, I was just saying the problem with that place is the charges at about well, I think David got a picture in his background though. Is that right, David? That is that Richard behind you? Yep. Yeah, I thought it was good it, the charges at about a uh, 20-minute walk from the nearest toilet or cafe. <laughs> no, it's not. It's about three minutes. Well, that's what, got, that's what I was gonna say. I was mentioning to Dave before we came on live that I just how brilliant that is when the Scottish drivers all met up at uh, Stirling. They had this fantastic, it's got 72 outlets, I think <laughs> six, or so, six or so are rapid chargers, and it was absolutely <laughs> That was the one thing we were saying, if you want a cup of tea, you've got a, a 20 minute walk or something. Uh, um. Well, that's the only thing that's on the road with me. I mean, when, when, when I go up to Weiss with me, I drop it off at the shop and say, right, go and get some uh, some food, a cup of tea or whatever. Yeah. I'll go sit down the yard and walk back. Well, need to get, yards. <laughs> it's need to get Sean Cullen back on and tell us what the tips for grazing during charging is because he was he was a man for finding his pork pie and bottle of juice with it. It's great, it's, it's brilliant. It is, it's brilliant. There's a new um, two Interpol units um, being installed in Newport at the new drive through uh, Costa. So, literally, you drive through. Get your cost down and then park up and uh, plug into the intervolt. Mm. McDonald's are using an, uh, most of the McDonald's now are getting intervolt, a lot of them. Quite yeah, a lot of them. Um, quite a few. 
same quite you yourself with but when, when I was down there they said well, on, on McDonald's uh, car park yeah there's uh, two in um, Port Albert um, okay. um, uh, to McDonald's so if you ever go in West Wales stop off uh, <coughs> McDonald's and away you go we stopped at, we stopped at Morrison near Swansea it's funny how you get the charge of your log. Yeah, when you're traveling, it's funny how you find chargers that you absolutely love and you know they're reliable and you'll go to them. They're reliable, aren't they? You know they're going to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know you're yeah. going to get them and they're going to work. Yeah. So that's, that's the main thing. You know, cost is irrelevant if you know it's going to work. It's not going looking for something at 25 pence if you get there and it doesn't work. Mm. You've got both yeah, we, we've. Oh, it's going to work. So, okay, it's 15 p here, but so what? Yeah. Certainly, with yeah, it's it's interesting when we're talking about the speeds and the driving and things. Um, quite a few people are kind of mentioning that um, you know it's still cheaper. Whatever we do, isn't it? Oh God, yeah. It, it is. It's funny the the massive difference between having an ice car and having an electric car. No matter, even if we charge occasionally. Um, Probably these... somewhere around I honestly it's seventy pence or something like that for uh, yeah, the yeah. expensive charge regarding <laughs> petrol or diesel. Um, mm -hmm. To get equivalents, I mean, basically anything below forty pences. Miles, I love. You're this. on the road. You're on the road. It's simple as that. There's nothing we can do about it. You've got to charge it. Yeah, for sure. Miles, I love this. At the insta vault, I was saying to my wife, "Oh my God, this is going to cost me about nine pounds to charge up." <laughs> oh, for God's sake, so listen to yourself. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. It's got to yeah. be done. Yeah. It's got to be done. Yeah. Uh, I did something similar the other day. I, I was. Um, Coming back from Nottingham, and we, we stopped for some food, me and my son, and uh, went to Burger King. It was like fifteen pounds for, for two meals. Um, uh, and you think, sort of, you know, I sort of, I sort of think I was, I didn't bother charging at the services because I thought, oh, I'll be able to get home without charging, and the charge would have cost me like, you know, why is it like eight quid, something like that, you know? But I spent fifteen pounds on, yeah, on junk food, on junk yeah. food. Um, <laughs> But uh, but yeah the uh, yeah I was sort of like it's like oh I won't bother charging I don't need it and to be fair actually it was um, which one was it Tib Shelf Services and there was there was already two Leafs charging I thought they need it more than me <laughs> no point, you're right know, very magnanimous of me I thought you know I, I I've got you know I've got forty percent left or whatever that, those guys obviously need it a lot more than me yeah no fair play there's a bit of courtesy at the pumps there at right? the charges I guess. Um, right, so um, this is quite five heavy this evening, so apologies. But the other one, um, one of the, the, the busy or the, one of the more replies on one of the posts on the forum was about a whining noise coming from... Yeah. The, um, and, Miles, I don't know if you've had any um, people complain or have you heard of that whining noise. Um, looking through the thread this evening... Some people think it's the motor, um, which Les, I think you mentioned, didn't you? It, the, the low speeds, it does that because it has to, um, as a friend of mine calls it, Tron mode. Where, but yeah, so it's whether it's the it's whether it's the artificially created uh, pedestrian warning noise yeah. which is um, generated from the speed. But this wine, yeah, this wine comes at a different speed, and some there was a bit from February, wasn't it, with the air con. Was it compressor less? Did you? I, I think it was a cool. I think it was the cooling. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. So no, don't know anything about that, Miles. I'm, I'm trying to quit look through the, the thread now. Um, I've I've not noticed any in the cars that I've driven. I've driven several MG5s. Um, I think this is my sixth. And it is one. He had a he had a, a few oh. thousand miles in each one. And I've not seen noises, but. So it, I would say if there is an if there is a noise, take it to your dealer and, and ask it to get you know, exactly. checked exactly. out. But, uh, it's not it's not I can't say that they all do that. If it's a noise and you're worried about it, take it to a dealer because what I wouldn't like to say is, oh yeah, they all do that. It's just the you know, virtual noise pedestrian warning thing, and then you know something seizes up and goes massively wrong and you're stuck in the middle of nowhere. So I would, if you're concerned about a noise, take it into your dealer and get them to investigate. But which was I, the advice as well on the thread, I think, wasn't it? Because yeah, but I've, I've, got on record. Yeah. I've, How many people have got squealing brakes? I mean, my car's been back now three times. It's still not big. Squealing brakes on, in reverse, basically. The squealing brakes in reverse. I, I, 
terrible. I don't, I don't have a solution to that. Uh, can you go out and do it now, Les, and record it, and then we can have it? <laughs> I've actually done that. I actually took, uh, I did a recording. My wife, my mic fell on me coming off my driveway, uh, just reversing off my driveway um, on the phone, and I took it to the dealer and showed them exactly what was happening. They had the car the first day and did about 10 minutes work on it, so they couldn't find nothing. Then they kept it overnight. They had it overnight to try it to sell the next one. They said, yes, they did hear it's queer, but it was the front brakes, not the rear brakes. But they cleaned the front brakes, put it back together, fine, no problem. I don't know what they did with it. I picked it up at 5 o'clock the same night. And uh, next morning, I got up, went out in it the next morning, just as bad as ever, no different whatsoever. So I phoned them up again and told them they had it in again last week. And they had another go at it, the rear brakes this time, and it's still doing it. So I've, 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 I have been in touch with them. I've told them it's not cured. Uh, but I'm going away tomorrow, so I said I'll fix it when I come back. I'll sort it out when I come back. So is, is, are you sure it's not your neighbours? How well do you get on with them? Every time no, it's not my neighbour. My name is my name is complaining. I'm I'm interfering with her beauty sleep. Because your neighbour's there with some whiny, noisy thing. As every time you get in the car, <laughs> <laughs> don't want them raid silent. You know, you show the wall. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It yeah, sounds imagine. a bit like it's terrible. It really is bad when it starts. Brilliant. Um, the funny part about it is, uh, if I go off the drive pretty straight, don't turn so I mean, my road's not very wide, I've got to turn eventually. But if I go off straight as long as, as far as I can, it doesn't do it. As soon as I come off the drive and I start turning, no matter which way I go with it, it squeals. And yeah. some people was complaining they had squeal from the steering in reverse. Well, it's not the steering. Definitely, I've never heard anything of the steering. And lots of people have said, no, it's not the steering, it's the brakes is doing it. And it is the brakes. And uh, somewhere along the line, they're going to have to get the whole lot stripped out and look at it properly. So I'll be, I'll be chasing it up as soon as I come back. I'll get that. Yeah. This is it. Well, I think I they've got... Admit, you know what I mean? You've got, you've, got to go, you've got a problem. Just keep them involved, no matter what it is. Yeah. Winding gearbox, winding air conditioning, no matter what it is. Let your dealer know about it. You might not be able to get it in that day or even that solid week. I mean, I had to wait over a week to get it in the first time because they're busy and whatever. So you just got to let them know you've got a problem and then get it, bring it in and get it sorted as soon as you can. It's the only way forward. It's no good grumbling about it. Yeah. I mean, uh, I can't remember who it was now, but somebody was asking on the forum the other day, is it the right way to go? I thought, well, what? what do you mean the right way to go? Go to the dealer. Of course you go to the dealer. You bought the car off the dealer. Yeah. Pass on the warranty, get it fixed. The squeals. We've got um, a couple here. Um, uh, Jeff Newport, I think, who's in Australia, I think. Yes. Um, yeah. Says so same problem with brakes as well as backing into home. Um, yeah. So I guess that's reversing on his drive, not driving into his home. Um, so the lady yeah. we have on here from time to time, uh, Jennifer from uh, Tasmania. Yeah. Yeah. She's got an MZS and she's got exactly the same problem. She's been in touch with me and said, let me know what you find, what they find. And I said, well, I will when I find out what they found. I will. But, but so, I think, as, as Miles, has, Miles has said on, on several occasions as well, it could be the lack of engine noise, but yours sounds a bit worse, doesn't it? Because I, do, I, think, I think it's, I think there's some sort of, I say it is a physical, you know, thing that's happening where the brake pad is rubbing against this causing the squeal. I think that's what, I think we can identify that's what the noise is. The point is, it should be fully releasing and not and not binding yeah. like that. But I think that is, I'm not sure if it's a, like a heat temperature thing where the car's parked up and it's you know the the temperature the components cool down as the, you know overnight and then it's all the sweet next day or if it's expanding. It's only the first thing in the morning, man. Some cold. Yeah. Just give me one second. So <laughs> Hey, this is a new feature we've added. Folk coming and going during podcasts. Break squeal. No, no, no. Just for all sake. Go on, carry on, carry on. Yeah. So, even, so Richard Chipchase has mentioned that the same happens. So Les is not alone. He's suffering. He's not. He's not. He's suffering with other people. You know. So, Several people. Don't. Yeah, exactly. So do you get that in the ZS? So yes, I think a few ZS owners. No, you're shaking your heads. No. Not me. Other people have said to have it. Yeah. I've heard of it, yeah, but mm. no. no, fair enough. I don't know what it is. So here, here, I'll just try. I don't know if you can see this or not, or whether you can hear it, but just I'll try to show you. 
Oh, that was a definite squeak, yeah. Yeah. That was that a cat underneath the wheels? <laughs> yeah. Was it? That's what it sounded like. When it broke, Sam, that's all. So he had run over a cat. We almost had it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The coincidence the last, uh, That's not just once. This this is another video of actually the same thing going the other way. No wonder the neighbours are losing sleep. <laughs> Oh, it's the same one. That's the same one. Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. That's definitely a squeak. It's, it's obviously it's some. It sounds like it's the brakes binding on the on the, from the calipers. It yeah, sounds, yeah. But it's got, it's, it's how got, we get them to release enough so that they're I not mean, doing it. You know, I've I mean, got a solution. They, they so cold, stripped it apart, cleaned it, uh, put a bit of lubricant on it, whatever they've done. I don't know. I'll be honest with you. It must have been in the workshop. Half an hour at the very outside. Well, I suppose you know the thing is that they're, they're limited as to what they can physically do. If there's no yeah. damage to the pistons, to the you know, if everything's actuating correctly, if they put the if the pads moving the correct distance, if they can see a gap once it's released, then it's you know, and it's not binding when they're moving it by hand. Well, exactly, it's not binding, it's, but it's just doing it from cold. I don't want it. Just does it from cold. It's absolutely <laughs> annoying at times, especially yeah. if I'm going out. WD forty. Bit of WD forty. <laughs> sort it right out. <laughs> <laughs> Can I make a suggestion, Des? When you get home, reverse onto your drive. Yeah. And then when you drive off, will it still squeal? Uh, I'm sorry, Stuart, but I never, I never reverse onto the drive because my charge point is in the garage uh, and I've got to plug it in. The cable's not long enough to reach. EV first world problems. <laughs> well, I will try for you, Stuart. I will try. I will let you know. Thank you. Is it a tethered charger or is it an untethered charger? It's uh, a tethered charger, it's a zappy. It's about five and a half, six metres long with the cable on it, and it won't quite reach. I have tried to do that, actually. It would not quite reach. It would so be interesting to see. To charge. And, it's, and as well, Les, it's safer to drive off of your drive than reverse off of it as well. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> My driving skills are good enough to go backwards or forwards. I'm not bothered. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Have we got anything else to bring up in this evening's podcast? Anything going on? The People channel? mentioning how the ZS, it's annoying the vagueness of range when you're getting low. And they're saying, wouldn't it be better if they actually introduced a specific percentage or miles? They must be able to work that out, you would have thought. But yeah, so I, um, when we were discussing obviously the changes that happened for Comfort 2, so back in the early days of the ZS where you had all the bonds and things like that, um, we made I made a suggestion list which we sent to MG, and there were lots of suggestions on there. One of which was, Can we please show the range constantly in the on the dash so that you can physically see? We don't need to see the clock because there's a clock on the center. What we need to see is, you know, how many miles you've got left. So that's one of the things we did. And we said that, you know, that button that shows you range, wouldn't it be handy if it showed you percentage that was left on the, you know, if you can't show it on the display anywhere, on the, you know, on the, in front of the driver, because there's not enough room on the pixels or whatever, you know, to put the percentage in. Can we not have it so that when you flick the switch, it pops up with the screen saying how many percent it was? And unfortunately, that didn't happen. And they said they couldn't make it happen in this version of the car. I don't know why, but they said they couldn't make it happen. So um, obviously the MG5 has got a percentage readout. The ZS EV forthcoming to be announced, not to be discussed by Miles now, will no doubt have a percentage readout on the dashboard. And um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's unfortunately, it's one of those things when they were designing the car in China, they thought that a standard fuel type gauge with segments on it was more familiar to more users. And so that's why they went with that. Um, and also I think there's, there is also the, the counter argument. If you're trying to protect the battery and trying to make sure that the battery lasts a long time, it's kind of better that your drivers don't drive it all the way down to 1% remaining, that they actually do charge it before. Cause taking a battery really, really low is not good for the chemistry. So in some ways you kind of, that's why it goes dash, dash, dash. So it doesn't guarantee the mileage and things because when battery cell voltages get really, really low like that, they can actually 
well, you get the one that drops a little bit lower than the rest, and that then basically makes makes the pack fail. So, in terms of um, you know, sort of wanting longevity out of the pack and everything like that, you, you kind of don't want people to take it down to one percent remaining. If it's off balance, then one will drop like a stone. You know, that's it. yeah, yeah. So I think that you know, having the the fuel gauge type readout is easier. But you know, in in that sense. But I think also uh, there are some other cars which just don't give a percentage. So the the Corsa E doesn't give a percentage readout. Uh, that just gives a bar chart. And it has to say that the um, having driven the Corsa E, its guessometer is horrendous. So it only updates the mileage, uh, the mileage remaining every sort of block of six miles, I think it is, or eight miles. Mm. So you're sort of you're driving along with it, sort of saying two hundred miles, and then it drops to one hundred ninety two. Then it drops down to 184, and you sort of you're driving it sort of dropping in blocks like that. It doesn't drop sequentially as you're driving. It makes it quite worrying to drive. But then also depending on your um, efficiency. So if you're you, if you're averaging 3.9 miles per kilowatt hour and it drops to 3.8, it suddenly then recalculates the whole get the whole guess based on that new 3.8 instead of 3.9. So it's really really jumps around does the range guess on that, and it makes it really difficult to work out what you've actually got. I think, the ZS, I think the ZSEV, having driven at quite a lot of EVs, the ZSEV is actually quite reasonable in its guesses. And I think that it's actually, you know, it obviously, you know, it might start off in the morning saying 163 and you might only get 130 out of it, but it's kept you fairly well updated throughout that journey that you were only going to get 130 miles. It doesn't sort of start off with 163, then go to 130 within the first four miles, then drop to 110 then go back up to 120, then drop down to 90. It doesn't jump around like that. And I think that's one of the things that I do like about the ZS. As I dropped it, jumped into it the other day with 45 miles remaining on the car to do a 20 mile journey and knew that I'd be able to do that journey. Whereas some of the cars, some of the EVs, I'd feel less confident. Mm. Okay. Um, anything else in any other news or anything else to talk about? Because we're just no, folks but, slagging off Les's parking, that's all. Yeah. Uh, someone that, someone well, suggested well, as well, Les, Les parks sideways and uses his neighbour's driveway as well. <laughs> yeah. May as well, he's annoyed the neighbours anyway. Yeah, with his I'll probably, I'll probably start sticking it up on the trolley jack and dragging it off the track. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get some dollies like they do on the uh, Formula One cars. Yeah, get a dolly up and lift it out on that, yeah. I, I used to have a I'm sure. I'm very happy with the car. I have been... I've been happy all along with the car. I've no no complaints whatsoever. Uh, yeah, I was a bit disappointed when they came out with this upgrade, but at the end of the day, that's the way it goes. And I'm not going to change it just for the sake of that. It's just not worth it for me. No. But I do anyway. I'm quite happy with the car for the moment. When something comes along, for example, the Model R or whatever, then maybe I may look. Uh, I have been looking. I mean, I got a, a call out. As you know, I had a score of play, and I got a call up the dealer said, the yeah, Enyaq's in, you want to come and try it, you know, but yeah. Lovely, I went down and looked at it, but the price is, I'm afraid it's outside my range. Mm. So we'll see. Right. Great car, lovely car, but no, it's too, too expensive. But what I do anyway, it's too expensive. Let's, um, let's wrap up for this evening then. So, um, so before we go, there's a few things I want to bring to everybody's attention. I think you regular viewers will know what that's going to be. So um, so thank you to our premium member supporters. Uh, we've got some new ones. We've got EV Lover, Elec Car Ost. Um, I guess that's in Australia or Austria, or one of the two. Um, Goofy, MJ224, Dave A70. We've got Septian. Alan26, Jake and Simondi, um, who have become premium member supporters. So thank you very much for your support. If you would like to support us, please consider the MG EVs Forum premium membership for just £3 a month. It gives you the premium member badge, the ability to upload a banner, um, the ability to select the MG Red theme, and a discount code for the MG EVs merchandise which is a full 10% discount when you use the code. And if you're, if, and you're obviously helping to support the community and this podcast. And finally, please have a look at the merchandise and please check it out. And to, to make it easy, there's a, a link on the forum. Sorry. 
I'm reading it and it's all over the place at the moment. Oh, I'm all over the place. I'm a bit out of sync with this. So anyway, that's it for this week's podcast. Thanks for joining us. Uh, many thanks to Les. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you next week. Uh, Dave Stewart. Thanks, everybody. Bye. And then we've got Dave Bull. Cheers, all. Ding, and then ding. we've got Mike Fisher. Good night, all. And then finally, Miles Roberts, thank you very much for your contributions as ever. Yes, and we will be back with the MGV's, MGEV's podcast soon. Uh, please uh, click on the likes and subscribes. We really do appreciate it. It keeps us going. Thank you very much and good night all.